This is The Daily Climate Show. Coming up, improved food security and crops resilient to climate change. New legislation aims for a revolution in the way we farm. The human cost of climate change. How should the world deal with the millions made homeless by extreme weather every year? And the activist forcing banks to change their ways. We hear from a winner of the Goldman Environmental Award. Hello and welcome to The Daily Climate Show, where we examine the huge challenge facing humanity, speak to those working on adapting to that challenge and those working on solutions. Now, new legislation is being introduced by the government today, which will change the way we farm. The aim to boost food security and create crops more resilient to disease and climate change. It's all about gene editing crops, which is subtly different from genetic modification, and its proponents say will lead to fast advances in technology and huge benefits to consumers. So our science and technology editor, Tom Clark, has been looking at this in some detail. So, Tom, first of all, why is this legislation being introduced now and what will it mean for consumers? Well, the the purpose of this legislation is to make a clear distinction between, as you mentioned in the intro there, gene editing and genetic modification. They're two subtly different things, but the government hopes it's an important difference. And this legislation is coming in now because up until we left the EU, we were bound by the ruling of the European Court, which decided that gene editing and genetic modification were one and the same thing. Now we've left the EU, the government wants to make a distinction between the two in this piece of legislation to say they are separate. Let me explain what they are. So gene modification, GM, the one that we're used to, has been effectively banned in Europe. It's very difficult to market a product in Europe since 2001 when they changed the law. And typically gene modification is when you take a gene from one organism and put it into another. For example, genetically modified cotton to be resistant to insects contains a gene from a bacterium. It's grown in the US, but not here in Europe. Now, genetic editing allows you to go into uh, an organism and edit, literally like editing the text in a book using bits of bacterial DNA to make some edits, change, you can shuffle genes around, repeat them, delete them to make changes. You then take those genes out and you're left with an organism that contains its original DNA. The argument from the biotech industry, from farmers and from scientists, is that this is no really no different to what you could achieve using traditional breeding, therefore it should be different in law, we should be allowed to do it. The advantages, they say, is we can gene edit crops, as you say, to make them more nutritious, to make them drought resistant, to make them better resistant to high temperatures and give higher yields, which should be good for the environment and for society. So that's what those backing the proposals are saying, but there has been opposition as well, hasn't there? Absolutely. I mean, from the very beginning, um, when gene, gene editing was has, has, uh, first emerged as a technology about a decade ago, opponents of genetic modification have warned, well, it's just the same thing by a different name. You're still tinkering with the natural genetic code of organisms. That is not a good thing. That the changes you make could be the same as you could achieve from traditional breeding, crossing plants together. And let's face it, that is how most of our food crops have been developed over uh, the centuries, um, but the, um, it opens up the possibility, opens the door, I suppose, to expand that to further and further and further changes. So there are those who are ideologically opposed to it. Then there are others who are saying it's fine to look into these technologies, but to try and pretend that they are the solution to our environmental problems, they are the solution to the climate crisis, for example, is also going too far. Shouldn't the government focus more on agricultural reform in the UK, more sustainable farming practices, land use reform, um, better crop varieties. And they may have a point. We've certainly seen GM soybeans and cotton have reduced pesticide and herbicide inputs into central, in, in South America, for example, but it hasn't stopped deforestation. So there is that tension there. I think the scientists have got a lot to prove in terms of environmental benefits, but environmentalists are challenged by this too. How are we going to feed 7 billion people with increasingly plant-based diets if we can't improve the plants that we've got? Tom, thanks very much indeed. Let's get some of the day's other climate news now. And hundreds of protesters have disrupted the Total Energy's shareholders meeting in Paris this morning, denouncing the energy giant's continued presence in Russia. 
Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth and others said the French company should pull all its assets from Russia in support of Ukraine. Total has said it will gradually suspend its activities in Russia and will strictly comply with EU sanctions. Wales has unveiled plans to make its tourism industry more sustainable following the increase in staycations during the pandemic. The £26 million fund will aid climate-friendly facilities such as carbon storage, protection for wildlife and rolling out more electric vehicle charging points. Almost half of Britain's butterfly species are at risk of extinction due to climate change. From a total of 62 species, the charity Butterfly Conservation found that four are now extinct, 24 are classed as threatened and five as near threatened. But it's not all bad news. Two of the species most threatened, the large blue and high brown fritillary, are no longer in the most at risk category after successful targeted conservation. The Atlantic hurricane season starts next week and US forecasters say it'll be the seventh consecutive year of stronger than average storms. Climate change is warming ocean temperatures, which in turn leads to more destructive and damaging storms, according to climate scientists. More than 11 million people are driven from their homes by storms every year, according to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre. Now, these pictures show what happened when Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas in 2019 leaving thousands homeless. And in India in 2020, millions of people lost their homes when Cyclone Amphan hit the Bay of Bengal. Well, the charity Shelterbox is drawing attention to this issue today. I'm joined now by Alice Jefferson, their head of emergency response. Alice Jefferson, the prediction then is that storms will intensify. So what's the potential human cost of that? Thank you. Yes, um, unfortunately at Shelterbox, we know that the climate crisis is one of the greatest humanitarian threats currently facing communities around the world. Um, we believe that more than 200 million people will be uprooted over the next 20 years by storms intensified by climate change. Um, we provide emergency shelter and other essential items after people have lost their homes. And we have borne witness and see firsthand the devastating effect that storms um, and other related issues intensified by climate change have on the most vulnerable people around the world. It does sound like a huge number of people, but some people will say, how on earth do you come to a figure like that when, although the scientists are saying that storms will intensify, we've got no real idea of exactly which kind of communities they'll hit, do we? It's very difficult to say exactly who will be hit and when, but we are knowing more and more um, with more research and there is more credibility and assurance of the threats and the warnings. So the recent IPCC report has assessed how severe the consequences of climate change will be. And importantly, the, the report is clear, it's thorough and it provides a really stark warning. And our estimate based on this report and what you've mentioned from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Centre really is a conservative estimate. Um, and if we extrapolate those figures further, we know that millions of people will need that support. And is there a certain amount that can be done through adaptation to protect communities, to, to keep people in their homes? I mean, in recent years, the number of deaths globally caused by weather events, for example, has come down. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization. Is there hope that adaptation may be able to, to, to protect people's homes? Yes, I think really importantly, adaptation plus anticipatory action in the form of early warnings. You know, we've seen um, at Shelterbox our recent response to a severe storm in the Philippines um, over sort of the December period. Very high winds, huge amounts of rainfall that are comparable to Super Typhoon Haiyan back in 2013, which I responded to. Huge amounts of damage to people's homes throughout both, but the number of deaths on the second and more recent response was, was far lower than the first. But the human impact overall on livelihoods, on people's homes and shelters was, was very severe. Um, so from a humanitarian perspective, we must anticipate and prepare for the unavoidable consequences to make sure we, for example, work with communities to ensure we can support them to become more resilient. And many other organisations do that very well. And we want to make sure that we've got the right aid in the right place at the right time to help people. Obviously, prevention is better than cure. So we need to make sure that we're taking action now to reduce emissions. 
but as an organisation that specialises in emergency shelter after disaster, Shelterbox must be prepared for the inevitable consequences for families who are marginalised and most vulnerable to this. Well, uh, Alice Jefferson, we appreciate you uh, coming on the show to tell us about your work. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, the 2022 winners of the Goldman Environmental Prize have been announced today. From activists to lawyers, all of the recipients took on transnational corporations or even their own governments to force climate action. Among them was Julian Vincent from Australia. With just a second-hand laptop and a spare room, Julian was able to launch a campaign group that pushed all four of Australia's big banks to commit to ending coal investments by 2030. So I can be standing in front of a bank with a megaphone at a protest, uh, complaining and waxing lyrical about uh, their, their policies, and then two days later be discussing those very same policies inside the bank with its staff and its management. But that wouldn't be possible without the grassroots work, and that's the work that obviously um, Goldman recognises. It. It's, it's genuinely the people power. You know, it get, that phrase gets thrown around quite a lot and can sound a little bit trite, but it works. It's worked time and again, and we wouldn't have had anywhere near the amount of success we had if it wasn't for putting information in front of people, showing them what their financial institutions are doing, the custodians of their money, what they're doing, and then giving them the means and the opportunity to be an agent of change and use their own money as a force for good award winner Julian Vincent there. That's it from me. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.